Open your Bibles with me tonight to Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah 13, while you're turning there, I'm going to quote, uh, to begin this message, I'm going to quote from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 8, which says, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? And there are battles and warfare in our future, literal warfare, that we must all prepare ourselves for, not just spiritual warfare, but literal warfare as well. This past Monday morning, I posted a note to our Facebook timeline, which said, get used to it. Yesterday, Sunday, which is last Sunday morning, I was up at 4 a.m., as I usually am, to work on my sermon for the day, and got a call at 5 a.m. from a church member couple whose daughter, Christy, works as an EMT paramedic in the Orlando area. They were extremely distraught and asked me to alert the church to pray for their daughter, which I did, who had been sent to the scene of a mass shooting at the Sodomite Bar in Orlando. She had been separated from her crew, and the shooting was still going on. An explosion had just occurred, and she was scared for her life. It turned out that the explosion was actually caused by the cops, blowing the door open or a hole in the wall or something so they could get to the shooter. Christy made several trips to and from the hospital delivering John and Jane Doe's that had been shot and who they didn't have time to ID. She was finally sent home at around 7 a.m. when it was determined that there was no one left to save. All told, 50 dead and 53 others shot with serious injuries. I, at that time, considered changing my message for the day to get used to it, but decided against it, and I stuck with the program instead. But, and I said, y'all say a prayer for Christy and get used to it, because there is much more and much worse on the way that will hit home as this one did. That's why I posted to Facebook last Monday. And after I posted that message, I did a quick Google search on the phrase, get used to it, because uh, I wanted to make sure I've spelled the word used properly, uh, in the past tense, it didn't quite look right, and so I did a, did a Google search. And after getting past the first five links on my Google search, all of which were to the Justin Bieber song with the same title, uh, the next entry on my Google search led to this explanation on a website uh, called the Phrase Finder at phrases.org. Get used to it, spelled in the past tense correctly, by the way. Meaning, except that a particular state of affairs is inevitable. Origin, according to this website. Uh, this began to be used as a single sentence with the meaning, that's how things are, accept it, from around the early 1990s in the USA. By the way, that's hogwash. I grew up in the 1960s and 70s, and we used that phrase all the time back then. And myself and my two brothers were raised in my grandmother's home, and she was born in 1891. And she used the phrase as well. So that's a, that phrase started way back before 1990s. But anyway, back to the, back to the quote here. From around the early 1990s in the USA, here's an early example. From a report of a gay pride march in Washington, USA, in April 1993, by Simon Tisdall in The Guardian. We're queer. We're here. Get used to it, said T-shirts worn by some of the marchers. Note. Uh, the we're here, we're queer slogan, he said, began just a few years earlier. The earliest reference from, uh, for that is from 1990. This article was accompanied by a picture of the T-shirt worn by some of the marchers. Uh, I posted that picture in the bulletin today. Sorry of posting that picture, by the way, from the bulletin makes you mad. For those that think I shouldn't have done that in this family-integrated church where the children meet right along with the adults, all I can say is get used to it. This lifestyle is now being taught in the American public schools, beginning in first grade. So I close my Facebook post by stating that God's judgment is coming on this nation of queer and sodomite lovers, so get used to it. Fifty dead and 53 seriously wounded in the Orlando massacre. Guess what, folks? That's nothing. That's a drop in the bucket compared to what I believe is coming on this nation, because... The lunatics are now in charge of the insane asylum that has become Washington, D.C. 
not only the lunatics on the Supreme Court who have been given over to a reprobate mind for the most part, that ruled in 1973 that women have a constitutional right to murder their unborn babies. And that ruled about this time last year that sodomites have a constitutional right to same-sex marriage, to do what for centuries had been illegal in America and still should be. But also the warmongering lunatics in the White House and the Congress that for the past several administrations, especially since Bill Clinton took office in 1993, who have purposely moved this nation closer and closer to the brink of both civil war inside our borders and also to a nuclear World War III that have wasted trillions of dollars on useless programs while failing to modernize America's nuclear defenses and instead helping Russia to modernize theirs. Well, helping China as well, by the way. And who are now, while keeping the population at home, distracted with incidents like the shooting in Orlando, seemingly trying to provoke just such a nuclear World War III with Russia, while at the same time doing all they can to push Americans here at home, to put their fingers in our faces, just to see how much we'll take before we'll turn to civil war, which will then play directly into their hands. Isaiah 13, verse 1, says, The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see, lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand, that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones, I have also called my mighty ones from mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. Verse 4, the noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. Verse 5, they come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation, to destroy the whole land. How will ye, God says, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Verse 7, therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. And he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Verse 11, And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Verse 13, Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. And shall be as a chaste roe, and as a sheep that no man taketh up, for every man shall turn to his own people, and every and flee every one to his own land. Every one that is found shall be thrust, thrust through, and every one that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled, and their wives ravished. Verse 17, God says, I will stir up, behold, I will stir up the Medes, who are now known as the Muslims, by the way. I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver. And as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children in Babylon, the glory of kingdoms. The beauty of the Chaldees' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And her time is near to come, and her day shall not be prolonged. As with Jeremiah 51, 50 to 51, this prophecy was not directed against ancient Babylon. It could not have been. Nothing remotely resembling this type of judgment was ever exacted upon ancient Babylon. As we've covered before, the ancient city of Babylon was taken by the ancient Medo-Persian Empire in one night with no battle. 
with, without a shot being fired, and with no damage whatsoever being done to that city. After the Medo-Persian conquest, the city of Babylon remained populated, it even actually became Alexander the Great's uh, capital for a time. Historically, but ancient Babylon remained a significant city until 400 AD, when it began to dwindle down into what became a small village, which finally then disappeared in about 1400 AD when the water supply ran out. And then the desert sands covered the city up to the 1800s. That city never experienced this type of a judgment. This prophecy in Isaiah 13 is not against ancient Babylon. This prophecy, along with Jeremiah 50 to 51 and Revelation 18, is directed against modern day Babylon, in which we now dwell. Destruction is coming to America of the same type that came to Sodom and Gomorrah. It is coming. As for the Orlando massacre of last weekend, which hit home right here in this little church, this event bears all the earmarks and hallmarks of yet another unstable Muslim influenced by federal Asian provocateurs to carry out an act of terror of their design and with their direct assistance. To further the satanic neocon agenda of building an international American empire while insanely destroying America itself from within. To create justification for increased military action in Syria while furthering the satanic neocon domestic agenda of turning sodomites and queers into a protected class, a class to be protected from critical hate speech and from legislation that would protect those of us who are actually normal and sane from being forced into business dealings with them or performing their same-sex marriages or sharing public restrooms with them. And also, this has an agenda of completely disarming the American people to quash all resistance to the devil's new world order. That is the centerpiece of the neocon agenda, which agenda, by the way, is served by both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, both of whom are warmongers, neither of which will get into the White House, in my opinion. By the way, I understand now Donald Trump is reaching out for votes from the LGBT crowd, which he's been relatively silent on up to now. That comes as no surprise whatsoever to me. I knew he would do that. In my opinion, no Christian, again, has any business voting for either Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. But as for federal agent provocateurs directing last Sunday's massacre in Orlando, the official story is that 29-year-old Omar Mateen entered the Pulse nightclub, a well-known so-called gay bar, which wasn't so gay that night. They weren't happy after this happened. And, they, and shot 50 people and wounded 53 others, almost all Hispanics, by the way, uh, with, with allegedly an AR-15 rifle. A few of the victims allegedly came from the SWAT team that entered the bathroom with guns blazing where Mateen was holding multiple hostages, as was admitted by the Orlando police chief. The gun that was used by Mateen actually turned out to be a Sig Sauer MCX instead of an AR-15, which is actually an assault-style weapon. It's not an actual military assault weapon. It can't be, it can't be made to fire auto automatic or three-round bursts, which, by the way, is one piece of evidence that Mateen had assistance in this massacre. Omar Mateen's troubled background, his homosexual tendencies, and eagerness to ingratiate himself to law enforcement in the past, made himself a prime candidate for influence and control by the feds to carry out this attack. First of all, there is no way on God's green earth that he could have pulled off this thing by himself. There's no way. There's also no way that Mateen would have been exonerated and cleared uh, through two law enforcement background checks and a detailed 10-month investigation by the FBI, the Federal BS Institute, unless he was being protected from discovery and manipulated. By the way, if you're wondering what I mean by the Federal BS Institute, I'll tell you it means blatantly satanic, the Federal BS Institute. I'm quoting a few excerpts from Joel Skousen's very detailed, insightful analysis of this event. He said, my immediate reaction 
as a former Marine officer with full combat training, was how could one person shoot that many people without being interfered with? Right. It would have required at least four 30-round magazine changes, even if he only shot one each person once. An armed, uniformed officer was at the club and reportedly responded before Mateen had even entered the building. The officer was soon joined by two additional officers also, who also began engaging Mateen. So how do you shoot that many people when you're in a firefight with three other officers? Something doesn't match reality here. Right. It's very unlikely, writes Joel Skousen, that someone wouldn't have rushed him during a reload, especially trained police officers. This is not a huge venue where the distances were difficult. It's true that there was a panic inside where he started shooting, but a few witnesses have come forth with indications that the shooter had help. By the way, the 9-11 report has been quashed, silenced. Uh, they're, not, they're not letting it out because it's part of their ongoing investigation, they say. Skelson writes, remember as we consider the partial evidence we have at this time that the last terrorist shooting in San Bernardino focused on the husband and wife team, which I remember the news reports initially said there were three people. And then after that first day, you never heard about that third guy. But those, that husband and wife team were only patsies. We have the witness testimony that the actual shooters were three white males. The husband and wife were nowhere to be seen. This testimony was given to a mainstream reporter, and the story was only aired once before being taken down. But here's what Joel Skousen lists as the evidence that points to something similar in Orlando. First of all, number one, one patron at Orlando a nightclub shooting said, two gunmen heard approximately 40 shots, has no idea how he got blood on his shirt. West WESH reporter Bob Keeling tweeted, the police are looking for the suspects near the Orlando Regional Medical Center. Because they heard there's shooting going on over there as well. NBC affiliated television WESH quoted the Orlando police as saying, two attackers are suspected to be, in, to be behind the shooting. Orlando police later denied that there were two, but never explained why they were searching for another shooter at the Orlando Medical Center. Daniel Gonzalez and talking to the Palm Beach Post. Talked about the fact that there was a left and a right wing of the building. Uh, the one on the left was the hip hop room and it did not receive the brunt of the fire, so most, including him, were able to escape. But he did say he believed there was more than one shooter because he heard two guns going off at the same time from two different directions. Right. Another patron at the bar said there was constant firing and no let up, indicating that someone else was firing while the other changed magazines. Then Gonzalez mentions another key fact. Everybody dropped to the floor. Everybody dropped to the floor. We were trying to look for an exit. But the main exit was right next to the entrance where the shooter was shooting, he said. In a moment of desperation, we were all crawling on the floor trying to find a place to exit. I looked to my right and I could see people going through some curtains. We were digging through the curtains around and found a door. We said the door was blocked by a man. He wasn't sure if it was a club security person or an accomplice to the gun. Fifty people were trying to jump over each other, trying to exit the place. There was a guy holding the door, not letting us exit. He's like, stay inside, stay inside. And as he is saying that, the shooter keeps getting closer and closer, and the sound of the bullets is getting closer. Everyone starts to panic. People are getting trampled. Let us out, let us out. So Skousen's conclusion, very reasonable, is that there was another shooter and an accomplice blocking the door. Joel then says, an alternative explanation for the witnesses who heard shots coming from more than one direction and constant firing is that the other shooters were the police officers engaging Mateen. He says, but then we're stuck with the contradiction of how so many people got killed when the shooter was under constant fire. Officers would have had radios and could have given direct reports of what was happening to the police outside. So if the officers had driven the shooter into the bathroom, why the long wait for police and SWAT entering the rest of the building and treating the wounded? Three hours. The shooting began at 2 o'clock in the morning. I got the call at 5 o'clock and it was still going on. As usual, just as with the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City, the World Trade Center in 1993 and, 20, and 20, 2001, and many other terrorist events, the facts do not add up. Another factor here is this is yet another example of a terrorist attack by a Muslim who was already under FBI surveillance. Personally, I don't at all believe that the FBI is nearly as inept and bungling as they pretend to be. In fact, the FBI has already been caught in a lie in this situation and trying to pretend that they had no idea 
that Omar Mateen was a threat. The Washington Post reported that the FBI investigated Mateen twice, stating as follows. He had twice come under investigation by the FBI, once for comments suggesting an affinity for Islamic groups, and a second time for a vague connection to another Florida man who traveled to Syria to become a suicide bomber. Neither probe turned up evidence of wrongdoing, and Mateen had a blemish-free record when he applied for a Florida license to carry concealed weapons. And again, when he legally purchased two firearms, including an assault-style semi-auto rifle, just a few days before the shootings. Mateen was put on a Florida terror watch list. So how did this guy qualify for a concealed weapons permit and pass, pass two background checks to work in security? Probably because the FBI planned to employ Mateen as a useful idiot and made his way ready. Patsy. The Daily Mail, a British media outlet, broke the news that the FBI flat out lied about not knowing that uh, Mateen was a threat. They said a gun store owner reported Orlando shooter Omar Mateen to authorities weeks before he committed the worst mass shooting in U.S. history. Robbie Abel, co-owner of Lotus Gunworks, told the Wall Street Journal Mateen came into the store in South Florida in May and asked for heavy-duty body armor like the kind used by law enforcement. Staff at the store, which does not sell body armor, felt it was a strange demand. After his request was denied, Mateen asked to buy bulk ammunition. Though Lotus does sell ammunition, staff shut down his request and refused to sell him anything else. They subsequently reported the incident to the FBI. So they knew he was a threat. They're lying and saying they didn't know he was a threat. There's more evidence that Skousen uh, goes into, including he talks about Mateen's uh, prior employment since 2007, actually with the British military security subcontractor called G4S, which has uh, previously actually been proven to be fertile ground for useful idiots like Mateen, usable and useful idiots previously called Secure Corps. G4S provided security at all three airports affected by the 9-11 attacks. And uh, they also had bought uh, Argon Bright Security, which is the 9-11 airport security firm just nine months before the 9-11 attacks. And the company later ran operations at Guantanamo Bay. That's the same company that Mateen worked for. Other evidence includes Mateen's wife having prior knowledge of his plans and Mateen's very troubled and violent past that began actually way back in the third grade, reports from his teacher in the third grade of him being violent back then. So once again, it appears that the federal goon squad has blood on its hands. Whether it's the FBI or the CIA, it doesn't matter. Both agencies are controlled by the same satanic force. That's right. And by the way, they both employ the same tactics the Jesuits have been using for centuries to finally bring about the devil's agenda to bring all the nations of the earth together under the domination of that man of sin, son of perdition the Bible talks about. The immediate results of this attack are already being seen in a renewed mad rush to pass more gun control legislation, which will probably be ramrodded through the House by Roman Catholic House Speaker Paul Ryan, whom, as we all know, takes his marching orders from the Vatican. Another immediate result just as uh, George W. Bush used the 9-11-2001 attacks as an excuse to invade Iraq, when Iraq had absolutely nothing to do with the 9-11 attacks, this event will now be used, and already is, as an, as an excuse to invade Syria with more American troops, even though Assad and Syria had absolutely nothing to do with this massacre. This will probably also be an excuse for increased unconstitutional federal police presence in the several states. Where, by the way, federal police have no jurisdiction lawfully to operate and as far as most of what they're doing in the states. Most of what the FBI does in the states is completely unconstitutional done without jurisdiction. Don't be surprised if this event is used to justify a whole new uh, federal police agency operating in the states. I wouldn't be surprised. It will also be used to justify more hate crime legislation, outlawing hate speech against queers and sodomites. And make it harder for people to get guns. Amen. By the way, I want to point out also, there are some speculative rumors floating around. Don't believe the rumors 
that the event did not really happen. There are some that are saying, show me the blood, show me the bodies. A family member of one of our church families was intimately involved in hauling injured victims to the hospital and got sent home when there were no more left to save. This event really happened. 50 dead, 53 seriously wounded. But get used to it. That's a drop in the bucket compared to what I believe is soon coming to this nation. While Americans at home are conveniently and continually kept distracted by these kinds of events and by their entertainment on the TV and on the Internet, the American military has been leading NATO and putting its finger in Putin's face over in the Baltics, seemingly trying to provoke Putin to war. There's a couple articles I want to read from on this topic also. And by the way, please listen and follow along with me here. Some of you don't like it when I read articles, but there are some things in these articles that we need to hear. We all do. And the reason I quote from articles at times, rather than paraphrasing everything in my own words, is for credibility's sake, because I want you to know that these are just these are not just my words. All right, I got a couple. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to you know quote excerpts. First of all, uh, a couple weeks ago, got a post from Chuck Baldwin. Just I'm just going to read his introductory paragraph. His uh, post was titled "The Crime That Will Destroy America," and it was about America's aggression overseas imperialism. imperialism. And Chuck wrote, are the U.S. and NATO inciting Russia into war? To thousands of objective experts, it does appear so. Baltov 16, a NATO military exercise, is now taking place in the Baltic Sea in very close proximity to Russia. Over the next three weeks, this was written on June 9th, just ended yesterday actually. Over the next three weeks, Baltov 16 will draw together some 6,000 personnel, 45 warships, and 60, air, and 60 aircraft, including B-52s, from 17 nations who are NATO members. Baldwin quotes in his post, which is, goes quite lengthy, but he quotes from an article from a report that was actually written by Timothy Alexander Guzman titled, Provoking the Russian Bear, uh, NATO's Cannon Fodder for the American Empire. Guzman writes as follows about uh, Russian capabilities. In addition to Baltops, he says, to make matters worse beyond the Baltops exercise, Baltops, by the way, stands for the Baltic operations, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, a military and intelligence organization mostly funded by the U.S. government and the rest by the EU, technically paid for by the taxpayers within the U.S. and the EU, is moving forward by placing missile defense systems in Romania a reckless move that threatens Russia's security. According to a recent CNN report, the United States launched a ground-based missile defense system earlier this month in Romania. Uh, the system is meant to defend Europe against rogue states like Iran and not intended to target Moscow's missiles, Washington has said. Which Putin, there's a, there's a video with Putin laughing about that statement. As if we're going to put missiles in Romania to aim at, at Iran. Putin knows those missiles are aimed at him. This article had a link to a, a video where it showed him just laughing at NATO's intentions. The article continues, this time Washington's willingness to use Romania to place its missile defense shield, supposedly against Iran's nuclear threat, is not a laughing matter to the Russian government. Putin warned European countries they are now in the crosshairs, meaning European nations will be in the middle of a possible future conflict between Russia and the U.S.-NATO alliance. Reuters reported Putin's reaction in a news conference that took place in Athens, Greece, with Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras. Putin said, If yesterday in those areas of Romania people simply did not know what it means to be in the crosshairs, then today we will be forced to carry out certain measures to ensure our security. Putin did not leave out Poland's participation regarding the deployment of a missile system, missile defense system, when he said, It will be the same case with Poland. So they're not going to put up with this. Washington, he writes, Washington's European vassal states are on the road to social, political, and economic destruction. The EU's sanctions on Russia is one example of how farmers, working class people, and various businesses are experiencing financial difficulties and even bankruptcy due to U.S. NATO's reckless policies against Russia. He says Washington has moved to place a new ground-based missile defense system in Romania. But Poland's recruitment drive in the Baltop 16 exercise will surely raise tensions with Russia which are at an all-time high since the Cold War. Russia views this move as a threat to its security 
with NATO's encirclement of Russia is, is as reckless and dangerous as you can get in terms of escalating the possibility of a disastrous war. Next section in this article. Listen to this closely. The RAND Corporation admits NATO cannot defeat Russian forces. Russia is more than prepared to fight a war against NATO, which would not last more than three days at best, according to the RAND Corporation, a think tank based in Santa Monica, California. The RAND Corporation employed well-known players in the political arena, including war criminal Henry Kissinger as an advisor and George W. Bush-era neocons, such as Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld and Sec former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. The RAND Corporation report admitted that a NATO war against Russia would last between 36 and 60 hours. It says, currently postured, NATO cannot successfully defend the territory of its most exposed members. An attack on Russia would be the end of NATO, literally. He writes, Russia has capabilities that are far more advanced than what the U.S. and NATO forces have in their arsenal. As he explains, if push comes to shove, the S-400, Russian S-400, and especially the S-500 anti-missile missiles will block all incoming U.S. ICBMs, cruise missiles, and stealth aircraft. Offensive drones will be blocked by drone defenses. The S-500 practically consigns to the dustbin stealth warplanes such as the F-22, F-35, which the government just spent trillions on, and the B-2 bomber. The bottom line, he writes, is that Russia in terms of hypersonic missile development, is about four generations ahead of the U.S., etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He goes on and on. Long article. The article goes on to describe America's propaganda campaign against Russia, in which we're boldly blaming Russian aggression, Russian aggression for the immigration of refugees into Europe, when it is completely the fault of America, Israel, and its allies that incited the civil war in, in Syria in the first place. Asked at a Senate hearing whether Russia was aggravating the Syrian refugee crisis in order to divide countries in the EU, NATO's Supreme Allied Commander General Philip Breedlove replied, I can't find any other reason for them, their airstrikes, Russian airstrikes, against civilians, other than to cause refugees to be on the move and make them someone else's problem. So we're blaming Russia for the refugee crisis, which we caused. I'm going to go on to the next article. This, this goes on and on. He does say from day one, Islamist freedom fighters were supported, trained, and equipped by NATO and Turkey's high command, which is where ISIS came from, by the way. He says the U.S. leadership has done everything it could to, but to push the situation to the brink of disaster. First, its anti-Russian policies have convinced the Russian leadership that making concessions or negotiating with the West is futile. It has become apparent that the West will always support any individual, movement, or government that is anti-Russian. Now that NATO, in violation of its previous promises not to expand towards Russian territory, has expanded right up to the Russian border, with U.S. forces deployed in the Baltic states, within artillery range of St. Petersburg, Russia's second largest city. The Russians have nowhere left to retreat. He writes, a provocation or a simple mistake could trigger a sequence of events that will end with millions of Americans dead and the U.S. in ruins. Paul Craig Roberts was uh, U.S. Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy under President Ronald Reagan. And he's also, today, he's a popular and widely read conservative columnist, he wrote an article also called Fellow Americans Wake Up and Escape the Matrix. He writes this, Where do matters stand? On the eve of World War II, the United States was still mired in the Great Depression and found itself facing war on two fronts with Japan and Germany. He says, however bleak the outlook, it was nothing compared to the outlook today. Has anyone in Washington, the prostitute, Western media, the EU, or NATO ever consider the consequences of constant military and propaganda provocations against Russia? Is there anyone in any responsible position anywhere in the Western world who has enough sense to ask, what if the Russians believe us? What if we convince Russia that we're going to attack her? The same can be asked about China. He writes, the recklessness of the White House fool and the media whores has gone far beyond mere danger. What do the Russians think when they see that the Democratic Party intends to elect Hillary Clinton president of the U.S.? 
Hillary is a person so crazed that she declared the president of Russia to be the new Hitler and organized through her, her underling, neocon monster Victoria Nuland, the overthrow of the democratically elected government of Ukraine. Nuland installed Washington's puppet government in a former Russian province that until 20 years ago was part of Russia for centuries. He writes, I would bet that this tells even the naive pro-Western part of the Russian government and population that the, U that the United States intends war with Russia. Ever since Russia stood up to Obama over Syria, the Russians have been experiencing hostile propaganda and military operations on their borders. These provocations are justified by Washington and, Washington and its NATO vassals as a response to Russian aggression. Russian aggression consists of nothing but obviously false assertions that Russia is about to invade the Baltics, which have no attention to doing that. He says, until the criminal regimes of Clinton, George Bush, and Obama, American presidents from John F. Kennedy forward worked to reduce tensions with the Soviets. Kennedy worked with Khrushchev to reduce tensions caused by U.S. missiles in Turkey and Soviet missiles in Cuba. Nixon negotiated the SALT-1 Treaty and the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. President Carter negotiated SALT-2, which was never ratified by the U.S. Senate, but was observed by the executive branch. President Reagan negotiated with Soviet leader Gorbachev at the end of the Cold War. All these achievements were thrown away by the neoconized Clinton, George W. Bush, and Obama regimes, each a criminal regime on par with Nazi Germany. Writes Paul Craig Roberts. He said, Today, life on planet Earth is far less secure than during the darkest days of the Cold War. Whatever threat global warming poses, he writes, it is minuscule compared to the threat of nuclear winter. If the evil that is concentrated in Washington and its vassals perpetrates nuclear war, cockroaches will inherit the earth. Because I've been warning about the growing danger of a nuclear war resulting from the arrogance, the, the hubris, ignorance, and evil personified by Washington. Recently, he writes, four knowledgeable Russian Americans spelled out the likely consequences of trying to drive Russia to submission with threats of war. He gives a link to their article where they wrote that. So he says, don't expect the brainwashed American population to have the moral conscience and fortitude to prevent nuclear war, or even the intelligence to prevent their own vaporization, he writes. In a recent article in the Wall Street Journal, they reported that 59% of the U.S. population support attacking Iran with nuclear weapons in the event of Iran seeking only one U.S. Navy ship. Insanity. The insanity of the American people. He said Republicans are much less, much more likely than Democrats to approve attacking Iran with nuclear weapons, with 81% of Republicans approving of nuclear war, compared to 47% of Democrats. Follow. He says before it is too late for Americans and all of humanity. Arrogant Americans need to recall that those who live by the sword die by the sword. He writes about the economic picture being equally disastrous. I won't go into that. He finally. Uh, he finally says, the United States is the sickest place on earth. Now this is Paul Craig Roberts, former U.S. Secretary of Treasury. says, there is no public or political discussion of any important issue or the multiple crises that confront America or the crisis that, brings, that America brings to the world. The American people are so stupid and unaware that they are capable of electing a criminal and a warmonger like Hillary Clinton, President of the United States and are proud of it. He says, fellow Americans, if you care to avoid vaporization, and assuming that we do avoid it, live a life other than serfdom, you must wake up and realize that your most deadly enemy is Washington, not the hoax of Russian aggression or the hoax of Muslim terrorism, not the hoax of domestic extremism, not the hoax of welfare or bankrupting America, not the hoax of democracy voting away your wealth, which Wall Street and the corporations have already stolen and stuck in their pockets. I say amen to Mr. Paul Craig Roberts. Turn to Revelation 18. I'm about done. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? We do need to prepare ourselves to the battle. 50 dead and 53 seriously wounded is just a drop in the bucket. We do need to get used to it. War is coming to our shores. Warmongering lunatics are in charge of the asylum with two more warmongers vying for the White House, both of which will do nothing but continue the same suicidal policies. More and more people are coming to grips with the fact 
that America has in fact become an evil empire. In fact, the dominant force of warmongering evil in the world at present. In summary, Islam is a boogeyman, a useful tool to the American imperialists to help them build their empire. The real enemy of the world is a band of hell-bent lunatics in control of the American empire and its hell-bent agenda to bring in the devil's new world order. As for the sodomites that were gunned down in Orlando, I'd say if they had repented of their sin when they heard the truth before now, which I'm sure most of them did, they would not have been at that evil place in the early hours of last Sunday morning, nor would they now, even as we speak, be in hell. Revelation 18, verse 1. It says, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. In verse 4 of John writes, I heard another voice from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. For six reward her, even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. And the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit as a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord who judgeth her. So you say, Pastor, what should we do? What do I do? Here's an idea. Turn off your TV sets. Stop seeking your own pleasure and start serving the Lord. Do something that counts for eternity in the short time that we have left to do so. Come out soul winning with us this Wednesday evening. It's in your bulletins, by the way, 530 Wednesday night. Just tag along with us while we go door to door and house to house. Warning folks that they must repent of their sin and trust Christ as their Savior and their Lord before they suffer His judgment instead. Get busy serving the Lord. Warn the family members that you've been afraid to talk to for fear they might get mad at you. Far better to make them mad than to let them go on their merry way to hell. Get busy serving the Lord. Get in the center of God's will. And then let the Lord lead wherever else He may want you to go. You ask, but if America is Babylon, don't we need to move out of the country? The Bible says, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. The Bible also says, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. We don't have to move out of the country to do that. Separate yourselves from the wickedness that has become America. As Moses warned the people in the day of Korah's rebellion, just before the ground opened up and swallowed Korah and his company and their families, Moses said, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. Start by getting your kids out of the public fool system. It will destroy them. Stop bringing the wickedness of the world into your home to your TV. Turn it off and read your Bible instead. Depart from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing of theirs lest you be consumed in all their sins. Aside from that, I do not blame those many that are leaving this country, uh, those who are able. At this point, the Lord has neither called nor enabled me to do so. And I plan to stay where he has put me until he puts me somewhere else. I do recommend that folks living in large metropolitan areas should move to smaller towns or, or more rural areas if possible, which is why my family, we, we moved out of Tampa 17 years ago. 
the pictures that we've seen of war ravaged cities in, in Germany after World War II and the war ravaged cities right now in Syria as a result of the US led civil war there, I believe will one day be seen of American cities as well. Tampa, Atlanta, and many others. Destruction is coming to America of the same type that came to Sodom and Gomorrah. It is coming. 50 dead and 53 wounded is nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. Get used to it. War is coming to America. Millions will die when the lunatics in charge of the asylum in Washington, D.C. have their way. Some analysts believe we'll have a few years before that happens. Ask me, I think those analysts may be wrong. I do believe that at any given time, we have at least seven years before the final Armageddon event, described in Isaiah 13 that we read and elsewhere. However, I also believe that long before that happens, and in fact, to usher in the covenant that will signal the beginning of that seven-year period, global warfare will be unleashed on the planet as the second seal of Revelation 6 is unloosed, which says, when he had opened the second seal, Revelation 6, verse 3, I heard the, the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. That second seal is global warfare. At that time, when peace is taken from the earth on a global scale, before that seven year period, we will see carnage and death and misery never before seen on this planet. That will be intended to produce the shock and awe to scare the nations of the earth into finally erasing all borders and submitting to the devil's new world order. Personally, with the events taking place right now in the Baltics and in Syria, I believe we could be very close to seeing that second seal unloosed which may well take place before the elections in November. I would love to be wrong. I would love to, in fact, for my five children and my so far six grandchildren, I want to be wrong. But if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? On this Father's Day, I say to the dads and the moms hearing this message, be prepared and get busy serving the Lord. Get into the center of God's will and then let God, let the Lord lead you wherever else he may want you to go. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we do call upon you to protect us, Lord. We see what's going on in our world. We see the insanity that has become American politics. We see American leaders pushing America to the brink of nuclear war, pushing the entire world to the brink of nuclear war. America has no business asserting itself internationally like this. We have no business starting wars in Syria, in the Baltics, these other places. We ask for forgiveness for supporting this wickedness the years that we have supported it. Lord, uh, we ask for your mercy. For America, we ask for more time so our families can, can prepare for what's coming. But we know ultimately one day your judgment is coming on this land. There's no doubt in my mind that destruction is coming to America. Help us to prepare to be wise, and to seek you, and to desire and to determine to serve you rather than ourselves. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.